Testing YouTube audio stream. Testing one, two.
Good morning. Today is April 10th. Um, you're here for the uh, Assessment Appeals Board number one. Let's see, would um, Brandon take roll call, please? Yes, thank you. Board Member Cam. Present. Board Member Frino. Present. Chair Sisk. A present. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Those here to address the board today, I will place under oath, and this includes you on Zoom. Please raise your right hand. When I complete reading your oath, please state I do. You and each of you do solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give and the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You may now be seated. Okay, thank you. I think now Brendan will take us through the agenda review. Thank you, Chair Sisk. Item 5, Agenda Review for April 10th, 2023. The Clerk of the Board recommends approval of the Agenda Review by the Assessment Appeals Board. The Agenda Review consists of the following agenda items. Item number 12, application number 2111409, applicant Royal XC LLC, removed from the agenda due to submission of a withdrawal. Item number 13, application number 21-11435, applicant Sherry Manello, continue to June 12th, 2023, pending receipt of original stipulation. Item 14, application number 21-11470, applicant Michelle Haeckel, continue to June 12th, 2023, pending receipt of original stipulation. Item number 16, application number 22-10273, applicant June L. Rosenwasser, Continue to June 12th, 2023, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 18, application number 2210455, applicant Mark McDade. Continue to June 12th, 2023, pending receipt of an original stipulation. Item number 20, application number 2210918, applicant Priscilla Skinamonti. Denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 35, application number 2211117, applicant Pat Coast Financial Services, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 37, application number 2211143, applicant Eric Navarro, denied due to lack of appearance. Item number 38, application number 2211147, applicant Jamie Brown, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 39, application number 22-11162, applicant Robert Picconi, denied due to lack of appearance. Chair says that completes the agenda review. We have verified no one is present for the items listed. Recommended action is to approve. I so move. Second. Thank you. And if there are no objections to that motion, it will pass unanimously. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any public comments at, the, at this time? We do not have anyone present that is not here for an agenda item. Chair Sisk, okay. thank you. Do we have any board comments? Nope, all right. Okay, what we'll do now is go through the regular agenda and we'll um, go through the whole agenda first and see who's ready to move forward, who wants to postpone. Anyone willing to move forward will visit at the end. Okay, so application 20-11629, Hick and Lively Holdings, LLC. Yes. And we have Ms. Hick and Lively here in person, but we did receive a stipulation this morning that was passed to your board members for approval and has been reviewed and approved by County Council, the Clerk of the Board, and the Assessor's Office. So recommended action would be to approve the stipulation if your board does not have any questions. Mm, I so move. I believe we've looked at it already. Second. All right. Hearing no objections to that motion, that passes. Thank you, Ms. Heck and Lively. You're all set. Your agreement's approved and nothing further for you to do. All right. Um, application 21-10855, Andrew Brody. Yes, and also component to this will be item 10, application number 2211116 for Andrew Brody. Mr. Brody, come forward to the podium, please. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today, sir? Yes. About how long will your presentation take? Um, 
Could be 30 minutes or so. Okay, and do you have um, exhibits for all of us? Do you have copies for everyone? Okay, yes. great. All right, any comments from the assessor's office? Yes, um, the assessor is prepared to move forward. However, there's certain issues with this that maybe we need some direction from the board on how they feel is best to proceed. Okay. Um, for instance, would, there is a question as to if the 1606 response is considered valid or not. Uh, also, the 1606 response did raise some additional questions for the assessor, and we did try to reach out to the applicant, but uh, did not receive a response to those additional questions. So uh, we are prepared to present today, but not sure if the board thinks that's the best option. Okay. And, and Chair Sisk, if we yes. want to trail this and discuss it in greater detail in a moment, this should be the only case of substantive okay. nature today. So if we want to um, trail it and get everyone else out of here and okay. come back yeah. to it. Okay, that sounds fine with me. So we'll we'll go through the whole agenda and we'll come back and hear you, your side. We'll, we'll weigh in both sides and figure out what we need to do. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, next. Yes. Yes. Perhaps in the meantime, the board, uh, the assessor can get him deal with the applicant and see if they can come come to some conclusion on the, on the missing items. See yep. how important they are. See if he can get those items to you in, in quickly. Or do you want to just wait until we hear this at the end? Um, perhaps after the review, if there's a short break, perhaps okay. could we talk then? And would that okay. work? That sounds fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next item, application 21-11293, Moore Park Center LL LLC. Yes, and we have Christian Tucker with Altus Group US Incorporated on Zoom for this item. Mr. Tucker, are you there? I'm here. Good morning, sir. Are you prepared to move forward today? No, I'm actually going to ask for a consent. Excuse me, uh, that broke up. What was that? I'm asking for a continuance. Continuance, okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Yes, the, uh, the assessor agrees with the continuance. Um, we'd ask for a 30-day proviso be included okay. with the continuance. Okay, do we have a date in mind? If we have the 30-day proviso, then May 8th is too soon. Um, 22nd uh, or June, June 26th? So, Mr. Tucker, I don't know if you can see on the screen, I put up your options for preference, <laughs> May 8th, May 22nd, or June 26th. Uh, the assessor is requesting um, to provide data in the next 30 days in response to that. Did you have a preference of those dates? Uh, June 26th would work for me the best, I think. June 26th, okay. Looking for a motion to postpone to June 26th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So moved. Was there a second we to that a motion? Yes, he. he I, oh, you didn't. Oh, sorry. Second. Thank you. No objections to that motion? It passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. You're all Thank set. you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Next application 22 10263, Kyle M. Uh, Terelka Trust. Or Kelly. Sorry, Kelly <coughs> Terelka. Hi, yes, uh, I believe yes, we I'm have here. Kelly on Zoom, is that correct? I'm here, yes. Okay, are you prepared to move forward today? Um, I believe that um, we were going to continue because um, you guys didn't have enough time to make an assessment. Okay. Okay, any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, yes, the, the assessor just needs a little bit more time to complete our review on this. So we would request a continuance. And then uh, I think for clarification, was there an amendment necessary for this application? Is that this one? Yes. So I believe um, Ms. Uh, Tranquilla, I apologize for mispronouncing that, you wish to challenge the um, value for the September 2021 purchase of the property. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So, Chair Sisk, apologize for not catching that. 
First, the board would need to take action to approve the applicant's request to amend the application in section six to add the selection of box B2 for the September 20th, 2021 change in ownership. Okay, looking for a motion to approve the amendment to the application. So moved. Second. All right. Hearing no objections to that motion, it passes. And then um, based on that, a mandatory rescheduling of at least 45 days will be required. That puts us out to June 26th. Um, Ms. Tr Tranquilla, is June 26th acceptable to you for the new hearing date? Yes, that's fine. Okay, does the assessor's office need any more data, or are you okay on data? Um, let's do a proviso just okay. in case. Just in case, okay. Yeah. Looking for a motion to postpone to June 26th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So moved. Second. Thank you. All right, hearing no objection to that motion, that passes. Ms. Trinkle, you're all set unless you have any questions. No, that's it, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, next application, 22-10351, Randall Maru. I believe we have Mr. Maru on telephone. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Are you prepared to move forward um, today? I'd just like to request a... Oh, sorry. Good morning. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'd like to request a continuance as well. Okay. Um, any comments from the assessor's office? Yeah, well, uh, yes, we are also, we are agreeable to continuance on this one, and we would need a 30-day uh, proviso for this one. Okay. Um, any date in mind? Either the June 22nd um, or 26th or May 22nd? Whatever works for you, let me know. Does the assessor's office have any preference? Was one of those May, May 22nd? Yeah, any date works for the assessor. Okay. okay, looking for a motion to postpone to May 22nd with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So moved. Uh, before I second on that, I see that there was uh, data due by 328, March 28th of this year. Was that data provided? Uh, no, no information has been provided to our office yet. Okay, but the... The continuance had the proviso, correct? Yes. Okay, second. Right. Thank you. There's no objections to that motion. That passes. Thank you, Mr. Maru. You're all set unless you have any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next application, 22-10583, Evan C. Warren. We have Mr. Warren in person. If you'd like to come forward to the podium, please. Good morning. morning, sir. Are you prepared to move forward today? No, I'm asking okay. for, well, actually, um, I think the assessor is asking for a continuance. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, yes, we are agreeable to a continuance. This one, we also need some additional information. Okay. Is there a date, a preferred date? Uh, can we do May 22nd? Is that okay with the assessor's office? Yes, that'll work. Okay, looking for a motion to postpone to May 22nd with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So moved. Second. Thank you. All right, you're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next application 22-11038, John and Kathleen Devon. We have Mr. Devon here, if you'd like to come forward to the podium. Uh, Mr. Devon is also representing items 22 through 34, applications 22-11039 through 22-11051, if we'd like to discuss them all at once. Okay, great. Are you prepared to move forward today, sir? I'm not. I want a continuance okay. as far out as possible. This is kind of a mess, and we got other things that relate to it that have to be straightened out. Okay. And I'm going to get in touch with the uh, assessors office and there's some wrong parties on like deeds okay. and things like that okay and so i'd put it off and i'd like to put it off until the tax bills come out which i guess i can't go that far in the future so we could do um 
And I know the assessor's requesting after June as well. We can do October 30th. You should have your 2023 tax bill by then, although it will not affect your um, pending appeals. Would October 30th work? It works with me for both. Yes, this would, uh, this would work for the assessor as well. This is a somewhat complicated one, so. Okay, do we have a data proviso? Uh, yes, we would need okay. a data proviso for this. And, and before the board votes, mm -hmm. I, you mentioned some complications on gathering data, so would you need more than 30 days to get the assessor the outstanding items? No. No, so 30 days is okay? To, to get them my documents. Anything that the assessor's requested that's outstanding. Okay, they haven't requested anything. I'm gonna tell them they need certain things and they'll request it, but I'll get it done. Okay. Because we can do, since it's October, we can do the next 60 days if that's... Okay, give me 60 days. Okay. okay, so looking for a motion to postpone to October 30th with the proviso that any data required by the assessor's office be provided within 60 days of the court date. So moved. Second. All right. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Passes. You're all set? That's it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Have a good day. Next application, 22-11131. Teresa Di Diego. Yes, we have Ms. Di Diego on Zoom. If you're there, please uh, let us know. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today? Uh, I believe we were asking for a continuance. I never heard from the assessor's office. They were supposed to come out uh, regarding the information I gave them. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Yes, we are agreeable to a continuance as well, and this one would also need a uh, data proviso. Okay, do we have a date in mind? Um, only need, uh, I guess, just a couple weeks um, is fine with me. Okay, should we do the May 8th or the May 22nd? Any comments from the assessor's office? I heard uh, uh, May 22nd would okay. work for us. <laughs> um, okay. Looking for a motion to postpone to May 22nd with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 uh, days. Is there any chance we could do May 8th instead? Um, the uh, the, the 22nd, I'll be having a medical procedure at Cedar sinai okay. Um okay. Is May 8th fine or should we go to June? Uh, June would work. We have a request for June. Yeah. Okay, looking for a motion to postpone to June 26th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Diego. You're all set unless you had any questions. Uh, no, that was it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. You too. Okay, next application, 22-11331, Hoffman, Haley, Marina, um, <coughs> Phil uh, Albertsons. Yes, uh, we have Dylan Hoyes with Paradigm Tax Group on Zoom for items 40 through 43. Um, I don't know if we can handle them all together or if we need to handle each one individually, uh, so I'll let the parties address that question. Mr. Hoyes, are you there? Yes, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today? Um, we would like to request a one-time continuance on, um, on, this, on this matter um, okay. to uh, May 22nd, if at all possible. Okay, and is this for all four applications? Uh, this, let's see, or this would just, be are we gonna do one application 2022-111, oh, excuse me, 11331. One one three three two, and um, one one three three seven. Okay. And um, what about one one three three eight. Is that included in this? No. No. That one, uh, I believe, we'll need more time on. I provided information to uh, Mr. Scott Bradley, but uh, you know, I, I believe uh, we'll be needing more time on that one as well. So yes, that okay, that one. We, okay. we can have that one uh, continue to that date as well, if possible. Okay, so May 22nd. Um, and does the assessor's office have any comments? 
or need, need uh, the assessors agreeable with the continuance and we will need the data proviso for these cases as well okay looking for a motion to postpone to May 22nd with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days so moved second Real point of clarification because these are commercial properties uh, to the assessors 12 days prior to the hearing enough time to review the data or would you possibly want a 15 day data proviso so that there's more than 12 days to review the data um, if if the applicant well could we make it 30 days prior to the hearing scheduled hearing is that possible can you do that mr. Hoy so that would be I think in 12 days from today you provide the assessor with that the, with the outstanding data uh, yes we yes we can we can make that happen we'll do that Okay, I'll rephrase that then. Looking for a motion to postpone to May 22nd with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days prior to the court, the hearing date. So moved. Second. All right. And just to clarify that applied to items 40, 41, 42, and 43, all of Mr. Hoy's items for today. Um, correct, Mr. Hoy's? Uh, that's correct. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Thank you. We're all set. Thank you. All right, Appreciate thank it. You. Have a good one. Okay. So next item Z, findings of fact. Yes, Chair Sis. So these are findings of fact that have been issued uh, by Assessment Appeals Board <coughs> one since your last meeting. Um, and so recommend that your board has all reviewed and approved these. So recommend action is to receive and file the findings of fact. All right. So move. Second. All right. Hearing no objections, that passes. And then we all had a chance to look at the stipulations earlier. Yes. Okay. I don't believe we have any comments on those. Right. Stipulations have been mailed to the board last week, and if there's no questions, recommend action is to approve. I so move. Second. All right, hearing no objections, that passes. Uh, <clears throat> so Chair Sisk, uh, all we have left are, for today are items nine and 10. And I believe they requested a small 15 minute recess to talk about whatever data was possibly missing. And if that would affect us or not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Us. Well, maybe we could, the board could hear the issue so we can discuss it too. if if it becomes something that we have to roll on. Yes. There's a lot of legal complications with this case, okay. so it would probably be best to be resolved uh, at the board. Um, so if you want to just take a five minute setup break and start the case at, start the discussion at 10, would that, that work? That sounds good. Okay. Okay, we'll do a five minute recess. We'll be back in session at 10. Okay.
right, we are at 10 o'clock. We are back in session. <clears throat> we can hear applications 21-10855 and 22-11116. Okay, so do we, is there a... Yeah, I, so first? I got some, uh, I guess I can start with some questions to clarify. So I think I confirm, Mr. Brody, you're not requesting written findings of fact on either case today, correct? Correct. Okay, and are you, sorry, let me turn on your microphone. I think you should be number 16. 16. There we go. Um, and are you prepared to move forward on 2021, 2022, uh, or both years today? Uh, both, unless uh, there's some issue that I would need to have a continued or okay. postponed meeting for the 2022 year. Okay, but you're at least prepared for 2021. Correct. And then I had sent you an email last week with some questions. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Proud, apologize, Chair Sisk, for not having this up and ready. No problem. Okay. So, the main questions outstanding at this time for the clerk of the board. Um, we became aware of that the assessor's uh, re office received the exchange of information response, but a copy was not received by the clerk of the board. So I just need to get clarification on that. Um, was the exchange of information request sent only to the assessor or to the assessor and the clerk of the board? To the county, to the assessment department, and the county assessor. Okay, so two separate copies were sent? Yes. Okay, and do you know, were, were they sent on the same day? Yes. Okay, and do you have any proof of mailing? Mm, no, just whatever date that was, uh, I believe it was 17 days prior to whatever, if you have a copy of the yeah. envelope, it should have the... Okay, and, uh, and do you know, sorry, the reason I'm asking is, is the law requires the clerk of the board receive a copy and we never received a copy. So did you, uh, do you know where you addressed the clerk of the board's copy exactly? To Ventura County. So was it, was the envelope made out to clerk of the assessment appeals board or just Ventura County? Ventura County, tax assess, assessor's office and department of appeals. Okay, so that would have made it to the assessor. Was there a second envelope addressed differently? No. No. So there was only one envelope. Is that correct? I sent copies to those. That was how it was addressed to those departments, the county, and 800 South Victoria. Okay, so envelope one is made out to County of Ventura, 800 South Victoria Avenue. Is that correct? As best as I recall, that's what I'm... Okay. So there were no references to the clerk of the board's office on that envelope. Is that correct? Uh, whatever the county venture assessor's department, okay. department yeah. of appeals received should have contained everything. Right. And so the assessor did receive their copy, but the clerk of the board did not. And that's what I'm trying to clarify is where was the clerk of the board's copy mailed? We are unfortunately, we're both at 800 South Victoria Avenue. Clerk of the board is suite 1920, assessor is suite 1270. Um, if there's no suite numbers listed, the mail room can figure it out based on the names placed, but the clerk of the board has received nothing as of today. So I'm trying to clarify the copy intended for the clerk of the board, where was that addressed to? Again, the way I read it, I needed to send copies to the clerk and the assessor. Correct. So you're, you're confirming you sent two copies. I don't recall exactly what was in the envelope, but I sent okay. copies to Ventura County. But it was two separate envelopes or one singular envelope. I believe, it was, I believe it was all in the, in the one. One it's envelope. Addressed to Ventura County assess, Assessment Appeals Department. I mean, if you guys have the, the copy. It, the assessor, did, but we're completely separate agencies. That's why, so whatever the assessor gets does not count as the clerk of the board's copy. That's what I'm trying to clarify. So based on your knowledge, know to, no separate copy was mailed to the clerk of the board's office. 
I don't know how to clarify that any better. Well, I, did that. you put it in two separate envelopes, separately addressed and mailed separately? I the, the copies that I sent. Were they in two separate were, envelopes? No, the, the envelope that I am explaining, Ventura County. Okay, so one envelope. Office, assessment Appeals Department. So one envelope, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, for County Council, uh, that's going to probably come up in discussion. Um, if um, I guess I can read the rule as to why we're asking these questions. Property tax rule, or sorry, Revenue and Taxation Code section 1606. Um, let me pull that up. I have it if it helps. That it, it provides that copies of the both the request and the response be provided to the clerk and to the party, the other party. Correct. Um, and it indicates that the um, that shall be done by US mail and the postmark date would determine the um, timeliness of such a request. So uh, just for the record, the, the clerk of the board did not receive a copy. Um, we did not become aware that it had been sent until, I believe, Thursday of last week when the assessor forwarded us a copy. Sorry, it looks like Wednesday, actually. That's when I emailed Mr. Brody for clarification. Um, so that may or may not um, come into effect in as far as the validity of the applicant's exchange of information. Um, again, the assessor did provide a copy, but a copy directly from the taxpayer was not received by the clerk of the board as required. Um, so that's all for my questions. I, I would follow up, um, since the applicant is not requesting written findings of fact, if the assessor is requesting written findings of fact for either of these cases. Excuse me, the assessor is or isn't? I'm, I'm asking if the assessor is or not. Yeah, the, the assessor will request written findings of fact for these. On uh, both cases or just 2021 with this exchange of information? Uh, for both cases. So that's it for the clerk of the board's questions, but I believe the assessor has either some questions or points on the exchange of information. Well, um, so these, this was kind of complicated. Um, the assessor's overall opinion is that we go ahead and move forward on the case with what information has been provided. Uh, the point of our initial 1606 request was uh, we were having trouble getting correspondence and information from the applicant, so that's why we initiated the 1606. We did get the most of the information we wanted, but there were some um, remaining items that we kind of had questions about. Uh, overall, we do feel that we're prepared to move forward today if that's what the board feels is best. Um, I, I suppose we'd leave it up to the board's discretion on how they feel is best to proceed with this. Okay. <clears throat> Any comments from the board? I move that we proceed on with the case. I would. Uh, second. Okay. I tend to agree with that. Okay. So um, since we're going to be moving forward, who has the burden of proof? The assessor has the burden of proof. This okay. is an owner-occupied single-family. Okay. So since the assessor has a burden of proof, they're going to present their, their side first. We'll present your side second, and then your closing arguments first, and their closing arguments will go last. Okay, we are ready whenever you guys are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad it's not a binder like last time. This Assessor's exhibit A has been submitted into the record. I think that's only one exhibit, correct? Just A, or is there A through? It's like exhibit A. Can we counsel, are there any concerns about the clerk of the board not getting their copy at this point? I, I don't, I'm not aware of any, what happens if we don't get it. Um, the clerk of the board is, I guess, okay with proceeding. We haven't actually got a copy from the applicant, but I just want to, since there's findings of fact, make sure we're all good to go with the exchange of information. Well, I don't think that I can make that determination. I think that, I mean, I can tell the board what the law is. And I think, so the law is that 
So the assessor initiated this request. The assessor must provide the request to Mr. Brody and to the clerk. When Mr. Brody provides his response, his response also goes to the assessor and to the clerk. That, then the law says the clerk. The question is, was Mr. Brody, based on what Mr. Brody testified as to what he did in providing his response, uh, was that compliant with providing it to the clerk? Um, recognizing that the Revenue and Taxation Code doesn't give the level of specificity about letter code boxes and all the kind of stuff about how to get it to the clerk of the board. So was uh, Mr. Brody's testimony about how he provided copies, was that sufficient to meet his obligations under 1606, recognizing that it didn't get to the clerk of the board? A question for the clerk of the board. Once you get this, not in this case, but in all cases, what do you do with this? Uh, we determine if it's timely and if it has the minimum required information uh, to proceed. And then at the hearing, we compare it to what each party presents to make sure they are not presenting anything outside of what is included in the response. So based on the copy forwarded to the, from the assessor's office, um, again, uh, the assessor's not usually an intermediary. They do this as a courtesy. Um, it, based on that, it looked like it was timely postmarked to the assessor, and almost all of the required information was provided. I believe zoning was not provided um, as required, um, but other than that, it met the requirements. So um, that's what the clerk of the board would normally do, and, and I still, at, at this point, unless it's in the applicant's exhibits, do not have a copy of their response that was provided directly from the applicant. So that's what we do with it. We don't base, you know, it's, I think more important, the assessor has it so they can adjust their valuations appropriately. Um, I just, we haven't been in this situation before, so that's why I wanted to make sure we're really clear about that we didn't receive it and, and gain the appropriate direction from the board. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Um, it, it seems to me like he did make an honest effort to send the copies to the county building, and they did get to the ass assessor's office, and they eventually got back to Brandon. May I make a yes. comment? Yes, please. Um, over the years in speaking to Brandon, it's always been about the assessment appeal application and, and hearing. So. I just understood that he was with the assessment appeal department. And that's why when I addressed it, it's in an email I believe I received that uh, stated copies need to be sent to uh, the assessor and the clerk. So when I sent my copies, I understood okay. that based on how I read that, it didn't say separate copies. Right, okay. So, I feel that as long as they were complete and delivered on time, that, that I think we're okay to move forward. I don't see it as a major issue. Agree. Unless anyone has any objections to it. May I add uh, just one small comment? Um, the assessor did, as uh, Mr. Phillips stated, we did receive it timely. Uh, it was almost complete. It didn't quite meet the statutory requirements. Um, I think as long as what Mr. Brody presents today, there's no real big surprises. Um, once we see what he presents, we'd, we'd be happy to waive that so it's no longer an issue, but we would want to see what's presented first just to make sure there's no surprises. The, okay. uh, you know, as, as he stated, the whole purpose was just to be able to initiate that dialogue about value with, with the applicant. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Just to assessor's point, that that is what the law requires, that Mr. Brody is not going to be able to present evidence outside of what he provided to the assessor through this exchange okay. of information. Okay. Okay. I believe we are ready to move forward then. Great. All right. Whenever you're ready. So this appeal is um, it's a single family residence in Simi Valley. It's a... It's a fairly unique property. It was purchased in 2005 for $1.5 million, $75,000. Uh, 
that purchase price was accepted as fair market value and that was enrolled and established as the base year value for the property. Um, we, we know that this property, it was built in 1984 and it had an extensive remodel uh, and addition and a large addition in 1998-99, um, right in that time period. So the, the house itself is 3,275 square feet. It's a four bedroom, four bath property with a two car garage. Uh, there's also a substantial pool house on the property. It's 100, I'm sorry, it's 1,116 square feet. Uh, we know uh, a little bit about the subject property because uh, Mr. Brody actually listed it for sale in 2013 for $5 million. He subsequently reduced it um, to $2,999,000 about nine months later. And he, he was actually the listing agent. He is a licensed realtor. And so from that listing, we learned um, it lists that there's hill, mountain, and treetop views. Um, it has a stucco exterior and concrete shake roof. The flooring includes carpet, hardwood, and travertine. And then the other thing that we know about the house itself or, or the subject property is when he purchased the property in 2005, he submitted a preliminary change of ownership report, uh, which is a document that gets submitted with all transfers uh, to the assessor's office. And he indicated at the time of purchase that the, the property was in good condition. So what makes this property unique is there are oil facilities um, that it, they actually existed on the property at the time of the original per purchase and the oil facil facilities are still there today. <coughs> so we're looking at uh, two valuations. Um, we'll just discuss the 2021 value first. And the factored base year value was 1,988,449. And the assessor enrolled a proposition eight market value of 1,195,000 as of January 1st of 21. Uh, today, the assessor is recommending a value of 961. And we'll go into that valuation. Um, there have been several issues uh, that have been brought up uh, by the applicant. And so I'll, I'll just kind of summarize those and then we can talk about how we dealt with, with each of those. Um, but the first is the oil well and the tanks that are on the property. The fact that the subject's within an earthquake fault zone uh, the fact that the subject pool and spa are in need of repairs. Uh, there's an access road used by the neighbors and utility companies. It, um, if you look at the aerial photo, you can see uh, that it's, the light, it's what's labeled Lightning Ridge Ray, Way on one side of the property. And then uh, the final issue that has been brought up is the potential need to repair existing retaining walls or add new ones. So the first uh, issue um, has been addressed uh, by making an across the board adjustment to all of the comps for uh, the stigma of having the oil facilities on the property. Uh, it's the assessor's understanding that uh, CalGEM is actually responsible for plugging and abandoning these wells. Uh, but due to the fact that they're still there, that, you know, that might deter some market participants. So the assessor made an across the board 10% adjustment to all of the comps to account for uh, the fact that those, that oil facility is still there. Uh, Mr. Brody also provided a soil report uh, where they, they estimated an amount of soil that may need to be removed. Uh, so the assessor went to Marshall and Swift to determine what 
it would cost to have that soil removed. And we took another $50,500 off of all of the comps to account for the fact that the subject um, may need to have some soil removed once CalGEM plugs and abandons the wells. Uh, and then I guess the, the final thing about, about the wells is the CalGEM, it used to be a dogger. Uh, they issued an order in 2015 to plug and abandon the, the wells. Um, they were unsuccessful at getting access to the property uh, from the applicant in order to complete the work. So, so they haven't been able to do that yet. So the second issue, um, it is in very close proximity to a fault line. It's um, basically right on top of the fault line. So the assessor addressed that concern. Uh, we used comps that were um, affected by the same fault line. And you can see from the map uh, towards the end, the fault line is, um, is in red there. And so you can see that all of the comps have been selected uh, from that same that same area, so they would be have similar you know potential uh, for being impacted by an earthquake. Um, concern number three: uh, the subject does have a very large pool and spa area, uh, and the assessor was able to confirm um, through aerial photography that it was empty very close to lean date 1121. And uh, Mr. Brody had expressed concerns about uh, it needing to be repaired. And so the assessor uh, basically did not consider the pool as to adding any value to the subject property. And so any comparable that had a pool, uh, the assessor removed the entire value of the pool uh, to account for the fact that the subject was in need of repairs. So the next um, issue that was brought up is that uh, Lightning Ridge Way, that road, um, may be in need of repairs. Um, when uh, the assessor's appraiser went out there, there were a, a couple cracks in the road. Um, so the assessor went to Marshall and Swift and uh, looked at how much uh, Marshall and Swift said it would cost or should cost around this time period to repave the road and therefore made a $23,000 across the board adjustment to account for the potential need to repave the road. Uh, the, and I'll also state um, the applicant provided some bids. The bids were actually for a neighbor further up the street and presumably would have included the cost of the entire road. The road actually goes well beyond Mr. Brody's property at Curves Around and passes um, a couple other properties. So uh, we would just be making an adjustment for the portion of the road that, that falls on Mr. Brody's property. And then the final issue that was brought up um, is with regards to uh, potentially needing retaining walls um, either added or fixed on the subject's property. Um, the assessor did ask for more information about this. We didn't receive any information and not having access to the subject property to see exactly what, uh, what the purpose of them would be for or the, the condition of the current uh, retaining walls. Uh, the assessor did not make an adjustment for this. Um, also, the the bid that was provided to the assessor was dated December 8th, 2022, which is significantly after the lien date in question. Uh, there's an annotation uh, quoted in the write-up here. Um, it's 390.0031, and it states that any information not in existence on the valuation date would not be considered by the marketplace in determining the current value of the property. So the assessor didn't make uh, any adjustment for those retaining walls. It is a th over three acre lot. Um, and so 
uh, the assessor is of the opinion that the market wouldn't recognize um, the need <clears throat> from a December 22 points point of view to um, to fix or add any retaining walls. Um, so let's see, I, I apologize for not numbering the pages here, but you can see the aerial photography. Um, the house is, is set back, the lot does make it. It is a over three acre lot, as I said. It gives it a lot of privacy. You can see the pool and spa are empty, uh, but that is, um, it is a very large pool area, and then um, there's, uh, like I said, an 1,100 square foot pool house adjacent to the pool. Uh, we also have the listing from 2013, which I included essentially because there's not a lot of information about the subject property. Um, you may notice that it um, talks about the oil facility leaking uh, toxic fumes. Um, but I, in, a, in one of the subsequent uh, exhibits that I'll be presenting, you'll see that um, the site was inspected and they determined that there was no uh, issues. And so then we, we also have our sales comparison approach. Um, we used six comparables um, that all sold in calendar year 2020. Uh, leading up to lien date, 1121. Um, in addition to the, the adjustments that I've already talked about, we made you know, typical adjustments for uh, you know, living area, bed bath count, um, the size of the garage, uh, the different miscellaneous improvements. Uh, and then you can see at the bottom, we, we also made that cost to cure for the soil and then the road repaving cost. So our adjusted sales prices range from $96,500 to uh, $1,154,000 with a final estimated value at the bottom of the range at $96,500. Uh, there's two photos in here of a gate and that's as close to the subject property as the assessor was able to get. Um, it is uh, gated, I believe it's actually behind two gates um, the second photo is a close-up of the gate, and you can see just a, a little bit of the house back there. And then uh, there's some comp photos here um, out of MLS. Uh, the map towards the back, uh, like I said, it, everything lies within that, um, that same earthquake fault zone. Uh, we've, and then we've shown how we calculated the soil excavation cost and the road repaving cost, both of which came out of Marshall and Swift. So I've got just a couple other exhibits. We won't need to go through them in detail. They're really just um, more for the record, and there's a couple highlighted things out of those, so I'll ask Mr. Blahakas to pass those out. <clears throat> Oh, wait, I didn't keep any. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me go ahead and let's... I think we can go ahead and hand them all out. <clears throat> no, let me give you one more. Sorry. Save that. 
I gave you that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Sis assessors exhibits B through E have been submitted. And if if we could actually, if I could turn your attention to the market evaluation, this is, we didn't label this one. We weren't sure if we were moving forward today. So I think this is E, uh, but there's no cover page on this one. Um, but essentially, uh, it's very similar to our 2021 valuation. Uh, this is just the 2022 valuation. We made similar adjustments for stigma, soil cost to cure, road paving, uh, and uh, we concluded, the assessor concluded $1,015,000. Uh, there were, uh, again, six comps, and um, as you know, market values over that period of time did go up, and that's reflected uh, in the sales prices of the comp. So that's why it's just a little bit higher. And then you'll see some photos of the comps that were used. Um, another map showing that um, we're, we're in the same uh, earthquake fault line area. And uh, that is our 2022 valuation. And then quickly, the other exhibits. Exhibit B is uh, the environmental, the soils report. Um, and in here is where we got the, uh, uh, the quantity of, of yards of soil that would um, potentially need to be excavated. And so that's the number we used to base our calculation on came out of this report. So I just wanted you to see that. And then exhibit C. Um, it's very large, uh, but it is um, all of the different inspection reports and things um, related to the oil well. Um, I believe I believe we've we've highlighted in red um, some things. Just a few pages in, you'll see that it notes that these are in compliance, um, and then uh, there's another section that's that's highlighted in red. It says, I did not detect any gas leaks and did not observe any liquid leaks at the oil loading facility piping or components. And that was a 2017, uh, a June 2017 report. Um, so there's a, a little bit more information about here. Um, we've highlighted a few areas like that in red um, to bring your attention to the fact that the facilities uh, are are not actively leaking. Um, they're just there. They're not operational. Um, and ultimately, Dogger or Calgem, excuse me, um, is responsible for plugging and abandoning those. Uh, and then our final exhibit is Exhibit D. Uh, and this this is just um, this was another appeal case that had come up from 2017, um, you'll see that some of the things, uh, some of the issues uh, in 2017 are the same as today. And so um, many of these, these facts uh, apply uh, to the current appeal as well. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you have about the assessor's uh, report and valuation. Okay. Um, does the applicant have any questions of the assessor's presentation? Well, I, I have statements to address about information that was provided. It's covered in my presentation. Okay. This is the time. If you have any questions of what they presented, now's the time for that. Then after that, you'll get to present your side. Okay. I have some questions then. Um, the 
excuse me, I'm going to have to bounce around a, a, a bit. Um, when you said CalGEM is responsible, <clears throat> who did you speak to at CalGEM that gave you that information? Uh, I did not personally speak to anybody at CalGEM, uh, but a prior appraiser that worked for the assessor did speak to somebody at CalGEM, and that is the assessor's understanding. In fact, they issued a plug and abandon order, and I believe you forwarded an email from them, um, and, and they haven't done the work. Uh, they said they had not been... They had not done it for safety and security issues or something to that effect. What, what is safety security? What is it? I, I don't know. Um, but I, I agree that they, did, they have not plugged and abandoned those wells, but they did issue the order to do so. Are you aware that they did remove the portion of the facility that is on my adjacent neighbor's property? I was aware that they they were able to complete the work on the adjacent owner's property, yes. Okay. And why did they not do it on mine? I could not speak to why another agency did not perform the work on your property. But it was supposed to be done at the same time. I couldn't speak to that. I'm not Cal Jim. What I can speak to is they, they did issue a plug and abandon order for the well situated on the subject property. Okay, and when are they supposed to remove it, plug and abandon it? I don't know. Did they say when? Not to my knowledge. Were you given any other information as to why they didn't complete the work? I can, I can look I, off the top of my head. It might take me a minute to find the right email. So I, I don't know the details of what all transpired. It's the assessor's understanding that there was an issue securing the uh, release of liability for uh, CalGEM to enter the property. Uh, and so you sent an email dated March 23rd of 21 from Clayton Haas. You forwarded this email to me. It says, Andy, this email is a follow-up to our phone conversation today. As I explained over the phone, DOC will not be proceeding with work on your property. We have decided to forego this work due to liability and safety concerns. This email is to provide you with a written response you requested. So nothing about that changes the assessor's valuation. 
uh, the assessor recognizes that there is an oil well on this facility uh, that's not operational and that uh, CalGEM has issued an order or Dogger had issued an order to plug and abandon it to account for the market impact, the market value impact of that, the assessor made an across the board 10% adjustment to account for the fact that there is an abandoned oil well on this property. And 10% of what? Of the, of the sales prices. So what was that figure? I'm sorry? What was that figure? Uh, if you look at the market evaluation page, the grid here, um, towards the top, uh, maybe about a third of the way down, um, one of the line items is stigma on property. And so you can see in red, uh, there's a reduction. So when it's in parentheses, that, that's a reduction. Um, and that is 10% of the sales price of each of the comparables. And how is 10% derived? So the assessor estimated uh, a negative 10% adjustment based on a number of things. Uh, the first uh, was a review of the, the purchase in 2005. And the assessor found when looking um, in a two mile radius of the subject property for about it for a year prior leading up to the purchase and three months after the purchase. The, the presence of the oil facility at that time had no impact at all on the value of the subject property and what was paid for the subject property. So I believe it was, did I say purchase for 1.575 if I'm not misremembering. Um, the next highest sale, um, it, in, like I said, this is a unique property on, on over three acres. And so um, it, it's, just, it's a very unique property. Yes, there is an oil facility on it. Um, it the oil facility is just as close to the neighboring property as it is uh, the home on the subject property because of the large nature. It's often one corner um, as you can see from the aerial photo. So the sales price of the subject was actually 24% higher than any other sale in the assessor's database for that time period that, that I mentioned. So then we also looked at, well, gosh, has it impacted the value of any of the other homes in the immediate um, vicinity? And um, one of the neighboring properties that sold as a vacant lot in 2000, so that wasn't a good indicator of the, the potential impact that was, that was very old. But it was worth noting, I think, that um, there was a, a very good quality 4,000 square foot house um, built on a neighboring uh, parcel in 2004. And then they started a guest house in 2019. Uh, so it didn't seem like the oil facility was negatively impacting uh, that neighboring property either and, and you know as stated it it is also in very close proximity to that if if not closer proximity to that property uh, so overall um, the 10 percent adjustment was based on over 20 years of appraisal experience um, and a review and essentially to give a benefit of the doubt that yeah the market probably would react to having an oil facility on the property and the assessor thought it reasonable to put a 10% adjustment for that. Hi, um, Joe Phillips with the assessor's office. I'd like to just add one more point to that. If you turn to the assessor's exhibit D, 
Um, this is the findings of fact for uh, appeal number 1711033. Uh, this case was brought to the board for 2017 lien date as well. And um, I want to draw your attention to page 10 of this findings of fact. It's the item 38 here towards the end. Um, so in this statement here, the board finds that the assessor's 10% adjustment to the comparable sales purchase price for stigma associated with the presence of oil wells and tanks and related issues was a reasonable exercise of assessor judgment. So I just wanted to kind of add on that um, we also wanted to be consistent with, um, with how we're valuing the property from year to year. So in prior years, 10% was deemed acceptable, therefore, uh, we continued that for this lien date as well. May I continue with my question? Yes, go ahead. So, going back to the 10%, have you done an assessment on a residential property with an abandoned oil facility on it? Uh, yes, this one. What was the property? This property. But and I participated property, in the 2017 <clears throat> appeal as well. But have you ever used a property with a abandoned oil facility with contamination on it so, to compare to my property? The assessor didn't find any other comparable properties that had similar oil facilities. In my experience, I have uh, assessed several con contaminated properties, uh, most, mostly commercial and industrial type properties. Um, but the, the point here is the assessor is obligated <coughs> to assess the market value and to estimate what the market impact would be of an oil facility. And for all the reasons stated, the assessor estimated that it would impact with a 10% negative adjustment. Okay, so you didn't use any other environmental appraisal on any other property like my property? So as stated, there was no other single family home that the assessor found that was impacted by an abandoned oil facility. Okay, so your 10% is just an arbitrary number that you used? Well, as Mr. Phillips stated, it was deemed reasonable in 2017. And I outlined uh, other reasons why it didn't really seem to have an impact on the value of the subject property to have the oil facility, but to give the benefit of the doubt, yes, we did estimate 10%. And when you say reasonable, reasonable to who? To market participants. It's the assessor's job to emulate what the market would do. And it's the assessor's opinion that the market would see that it's there, they know it's not leaking, and they may not wanna pay quite as much for the property, so the assessor did an across the board 10% negative adjustment on the comps to account for the fact that the subject has an abandoned oil facility. But that's just an opinion, not a fact, correct? The only time it would be a fact, what we do, we do have a fact of when the, the subject sold when you purchased it in 2005. And the fact was that the sales price of the property was not impacted at all by the oil facility. You purchased it for 24% more than any other property within a two mile radius uh, for the year leading up to it and three months after the purchase price. So the fact is that that oil facility has not historically impacted the value of the subject property. So that, that is a fact. 
But what the assessor is doing is estimating what the market impact. There is no fact unless it sells. And so the art of appraisal is to estimate what the market would do. And so we're estimating that on 1121 and 1122, the market would say, I'm going to pay 10% less for that property. And does the assessor have documents that show the facility was leaking oil and vapors and was non-compliant? There were a lot of documents provided to the assessor. I could not speak to every one. I don't know if it was in the past. It's the assessor's understanding that it is not currently leaking. Has the assessor been made aware in the past that the facility was leaking and was cited for leaks and non-compliant issues? Again, I think I just answered that question. <clears throat> it wasn't clear to me. That's why I rephrased and asked the question again. What's important today is whether or not it was leaking on 1121 or 1122. And it's the assessor's understanding based on the documentation provided that it was not. But my question is, were you aware, the assessor, made aware of the I, I, history, because you're citing history, and I'm asking you, do you have evidence that shows the history of the facility having leaks and being non-compliant? Mr. Brody, I, I can't answer that question. I don't have an answer to that question. I'll address <laughs> that in my okay. presentation. I believe you made mention two different times about not being able to have access to my property. I believe one, you mentioned the assessor. Is that correct understanding? I'm sorry. We did not. Um, we did not visit other than on that Lightning Ridge Way Road. <clears throat> we did not enter the property any further than that. Okay. But you've never asked me for access. Uh, the four four one D letter that we send out always um, requests a site check, and no response was ever. <clears throat> um, the assessor never received a response from you. I'm sorry. What is your name? Uh, my name is Brooke Hill. But we've spoken many times over the years. We have spoken many times over the years, okay. yes. And have you ever addressed with me asking access to the property? I apologize, but I speak to a lot of people about a lot of different issues, and I cannot specifically remember if we verbally had that conversation. Okay, and I believe you made mention that uh, there was no access provided to CalGEM. Well, I can reference that email uh, that, that you provided. I, I suppose I, I don't, it might take me again the same amount of time to look it up, um, but that was all the assessor knows. Again, the assessor's not here to determine when or if or how this facility is going to be um, plugged and abandoned. Um, it's the assessor's responsibility to estimate the market value of the subject property, and the assessor believes we've done that um, by doing this across the board adjustment for stigma of there being an oil well on the property that ultimately CalGEM is responsible for plugging and abandoning. Okay. 
that you're making mention of statements to the board and myself to make your case and to have a certain impression for justifying your value. And what I believe I heard you say was that there was no access provided or there was a problem getting the access agreement. <clears throat> Can you re-clarify what you were saying with that? I think I can just reference the email that I read uh, earlier from CalGEM to you. I have no further response. And which email is that? Can you please repeat that for me? Is it necessary, board, that I reread the email that I read earlier? I think it's already been stated for the record. I'm sorry. We've we've heard the email. We've we've already heard the email. I mean, she's already read it to us. Okay, I thought I heard her reference several emails. So I'm trying to get clarification on what she had presented to you as far as access to my property. Okay, oh, I believe she did answer that question, though. Thank you. Okay, it was for the record not clear to me. That's why I'm asking. Okay. Okay. At this moment, I guess I don't have any. Okay, no more questions. Okay, it, does the board have any questions of the assessor's at presentation? Do you have any? Um, could the assessor help me verify where the oil wells are in relation to the uh, home on the subject property? I'm Where the oil wells are? Yes. Is that the question? If you turn to um, the aerial photo here, um, there, it's in this bottom corner here. In the bottom, well, if you turn it so it's Lightning Ridge Way is readable, yeah, it's in the bottom right-hand corner. Where that uh, clearing is in the corner? Where the clearing is, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, let's just continue on that same question. If you go to Exhibit C, which like, looks like the trees have really grown in on this property based on the current, but I have a square there and then I have a circle up near the pool. Is that also contaminated, have an oil well on it? What is the purpose of that? That, uh, I guess it's an oval near, uh, just below the pool or just to the right of the pool. I'm not finding that, um, for, oh, here it is. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if that's active or not. And you, and it looks like there's two other, whoa, one other circle and one other oval just on the, across the road and on the, on the border. You don't know if those are also wells. So when I- I'm Based I, on this picture. Yeah, based on this picture, um, there are other circles here, I see that. Um, when I had looked up on CalGEM's website, you can see the active and inactive wells. If I'm remembering correctly, I believe the only active well was the one in the, the bottom right corner. Um, but I'm sure Mr. Brody will correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Um, going to exhibit A, the the photo at the very top it says parcel number 6140010-195 is that just a mistake it should it be 125 i apologize yes okay thank you for catching I thought that it was but i yeah I that that is the subject property right there okay 
Then let's go back to exhibit C and also pertains to exhibit D. This was prepared by Audrey Ramirez. I assume that's the, she works for the assessor's office, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and she's putting this information together? She did put this information together. Okay, or did put this information together. Yeah, and you'll- and then, oh. oh, no, you're- Still going on. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, now if we go to exhibit C, the next page, an email. And it talks about uh, an agreement. This is an agreement between the Department of Con Conservation. I guess that's the, is it, what do you call it? Cal, Cal Gem or something like that? Cal Gem, yes. And the property owner, who was Mr. Schneider? Sh or Schreiber? Uh, th this is for a neighboring parcel, it looks like. It's, uh, if you look at the, the header, it's to Mr. Paul Schreiber, 3941 Walnut. Uh, I believe this is for a neighbor. I apologize, I'm not sure why that's here. Um, I can clarify why that's there. Oh, when you. we requested information from uh, the tar Department of Cal Conservation, they provided this as an example of what the hold harmless agreement would look like. Um, so that's why. It's just a reference as to what would be expected in the home hold harmless agreement, and that's why it's in here. It was provided by uh, the Department of Conservation just for clarification purposes, and we thought uh, it might help clarify to the board as well, so we included it for that reason. Okay, so it's, it's just a general? Yeah, it's meant to be a general example. So we get into proof of service by certified mail. Uh, doesn't have a page on it. This is, this is a Clarence Barnett. This, I assume, is another property. And the back portion of that, well, let's see, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on Exhibit C, the back portion of that. Mine has a line through it. I don't know if everybody else has a line through it. Is that an accident of somebody's pen or this portion doesn't apply? Or is this, it, since it's not, not the applicant, I assume this is again something dealing with, you just sort of threw everything into the packet. <laughs> No offense, but can you can you hold up the page you're referencing? I'm sorry. Okay, let's go to it's exhibit D. You you get about I think I said we get to page one two three, then four is on the back, then five, then six, then seven, then you got eight, then you got a no number and you got a proof of service. Again, this seems to be addressed to somebody else. Another proof oh. of service, and the third proof of service to a client oh, or not. Yeah, and on I think the back that's of a, that, it's a memorandum of telephone conversations, complaints regarding operator Clarence Barnett. And mine has a line through it. I, I'm looking at the other board members and they have a line through it. Yeah. So that line, I, was, I assume just means Disregard this? No, sorry, that's a printer issue. That, that was the copy re, we received, and it had that line through it. It's just a printer thing. It's not meant to represent anything else. I'm going to show the assessor's office my copy because it, it looks like it's from a pen rather than a printer. Yeah, let me see. Oh, this yeah. Sorry, that's just how it came. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Now, I want to go back to your, I think there was five issues you addressed. And uh, 
Let's start with the, so you use stigma 10%, correct? Yes. And then you also deducted for the cost of removing uh, the soil. Yes. <clears throat> and I don't know if you have personal knowledge or whatever, but from the listing that was provided, it seems like some of the soil is contaminated. Is that correct? Or do you know? It was in the report, in the Anderson Environmental Sampling Report, and Mr. Phillips might be able to find the page that that number came off of because I believe he was actually the one that calculated that adjustment uh, for us. Um, but it's in this report that they suggested that um, that certain number of yards of dirt may need to be removed. And so that's where that came from. And yeah, so if I could just clarify for you, in the Anderson report, I'm look, if you look at, it's called Table 2 Excavation Area Calculation. Um, it's maybe around halfway through the packet here. So this report, if you get to that table, the report has in that table cubic feet, cubic yards, tons. So we can use that number there and take that and apply it to our Marshall and Swift calculations. And that's how that estimate of um, repair was come to there. And you provided the the original listing, or the listing I believe it was in uh, 2015, in which he is trying to sell this, um, I guess trying to avoid any liability for c contaminated soil. Uh, did you figure any cost for uh, the disposal of that soil? Yeah, so if you look at the calculation, we have it kind of laid out here a little bit. Um, it's in our exhibit A, the second from last page. It says calculation of soil excavation. So there is a cost associated with ex excavating it, and then we did add in additional costs uh, to haul it, and we asked them uh, we just did a rough estimate of about 20 miles, just to be fair. You know, we're not sure where they'd have to drive the soil to, but uh, a 20 mile radius seemed reasonable to us. So yeah, so the, the cost is excavation and transporting of that uh, contaminated soil. I guess my main concern is that if this is toxic soil that has to be removed, probably couldn't just be dumped anywhere. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have additional information on that. We just, we worked with the information that we have. Okay, thank you. No, no more questions? Okay, I think I we're all. Excuse me, I did have one okay. question, one. if I can. Okay. Um, when the assessor assesses properties every year, what program <clears throat> does the assessor use for that? What program? How do you determine increases in value? Well, I guess it depends on the property type. We have a lot of several different programs, if you will, that we can use to help assist in the valuation. Um, the assessor has a database of all of the comparable properties that sell and the sales prices and property characteristics. And so the assessor is charged with doing an appraisal each year when there's a decline in value um, to estimate the market value. So every property is appraised every year by an appraiser? No, not, not necessarily. Um, many properties, uh, once you purchase it, um, typically, if the purchase price was a fair market value, that value is then enrolled as the base year value under Proposition 13. And then that value gets factored forward no more than 2% a year. 
And so in markets, so then we would just automatically enroll that Proposition 13 value. Um, I believe I had mentioned what your Proposition 13 value was. It's about 1.9 million, 88,449. Um, so your value has been going up 2% every year or thereabouts. It's, it's actually mandated, mandated by the State Board of Equalization, they tell us. Um, the exact percentage to apply each year. There have been a couple years in a declining market where we've um, actually reduced it slightly, uh, the base year values. And then um, we, in declining markets, we may go out and decide to do proactive Prop 8 reviews in which we would need to look at um, each property to determine if the market value is less than the Proposition 13 value. And so that's what the assessor did for this property is we determined that the market value was less than the Proposition 13 value, and therefore we enrolled the lesser of the two as required by law. But when the new assessed values come out, I guess July, mm -hmm. August, you just adjust upwards whatever the Department of Equalization tells you to? And so across the board? Only for Proposition 13 values. If, if you're given a Proposition 8 value, for example, if you're given a Proposition 8 value for 1121 as your property was, the assessor is then obligated to look at it for 1122 to determine if the market value is still less than your Proposition 13 value, which for 1122, the assessor also determined that a lower value should be enrolled for your property. So when you're given that on either, I'm sorry, when you're when given you're what? given that percentage on either Prop 8 or the other prop, you use some program to assign that to those properties, correct? Or do you just have an accountant within the assessor that on each property adds whatever that percentage is to each property? So the percentage increase only applies to a Prop 13. So your Prop 13, if you think of a graph, is like this. And so your... Prop 8 value, if the market goes down, it could go down here, and then maybe the market goes up. And so that that can change. But the Prop 8 values do not change on a percentage basis. How, how again, do those change? Based Mine on Prop 8, correct? Yes, based on the market. Okay. And so the assessor for this property, we've done an appraisal and determined uh, what the market value is of the property. And since that's less than your Prop 13, we've enrolled the Prop 8 value or the market value. But are you saying that every Prop 8 property is getting a separate appraise, appraisal before those new assessments come out? Yes. Why aren't the comparables that you use for that change provided to the homeowners with their assessment? They're provided upon request. Um, under Section 408 of the Revenue and Taxation Code, um, homeowners are and property owners are able to request copies of any appraisal that's done for their assessment. Um, and so we do provide those upon request. Okay. And just out of curiosity, in, across Ventura County, how many Prop 8 properties are there? Off the top of my head, I don't know, and I'm not sure what the relevance is to this uh, particular uh, appeal. Uh, uh, it is relevant to how you guys assess those values on each Prop 8 property. I, I apologize. I'm not asking for an exact. We have a residential team, um, a rural team, a commercial industrial team that each do their own Prop 8 values depending on the property type. I, I work in property transfer and appeals and exemptions, and I... I, I apologize, I just don't know what the numbers are uh, across the whole county. Okay. That's not the section that I work in. Okay. okay. Excuse me, I do have an additional question. Uh, on your market evaluation, under miscellaneous improvements, you don't have to tell me how you came up with those figures, but if you could uh, just go through those uh, Short and what oh. is P A O O A S T for you? The, That's a they're fair obvious question. to you, but I have no <laughs> idea what what that means. Uh, you know what? Let me pull up. 
Let me pull it up in here so I don't misspeak. And if you can go, th some of there's a little bit different on, on the comps. Yeah, so the comps, everybody, each property will have a little bit different um, extra added features. So let me pull it up and I just, I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. So let's see this. We're looking at our, I'll pull 2021 up. So PA is patio area, ST is storage area, OA is other area, and that's kind of all encompassing. That can mean a lot of different things if it just if it doesn't fit into another category. PO is porch. Um, Would see, that be like a front porch or yeah, like area? a front porch, or like a covered about covered area in the back or something area. like that. Okay. Um, let's see. We got a BL. A BL. That's bacon and lettuce, but no tomato. Balcony, I think, is BL. DK is deck. Uh, are there any others here? BQ is barbecue. AS is active solar energy system, um, which I don't think we make. I an think we have an for. OF in there. Um, outdoor fireplace oh, okay. for is OF. I think that's all the ones there was. Did we get them all? Oh, good. What was ST again? I'm sorry. Which? ST? Storage. Oh, storage. Okay. Thank you. Chair Sis? Yep. If there are no other questions from the board, I have two. Uh, Assessor's Exhibit A on your market evaluation. Um, as Board Member Frino asked earlier, what does the clerk of the board do with the 1606 requests? Um, I, in comparing this to your request, um, <clears throat> Comp six was not listed. Can you clarify for the board why you were able to include comp six? Was there a question for me? I think Brendan. Did I miss yeah, something? Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Assessor's Exhibit A, Market Evaluation, uh, Comp Number 6. Oh, okay. I yeah, so I, I think I know the answer. I, I know I'm not supposed to lead answers too much, but uh, Comp 6 was not included in your formal exchange of information initiation. Can you just let us know for the record why you were able to include that as part of your evaluation? That was one of the comps that Mr. Brody uh, submitted. So the assessor went ahead and included it. Included. Thank you. And, and Mr. Brody, again, I haven't received an official copy of your um, response. Can you just confirm that assessor's comp six was part of the comps you provided in your response? <coughs> It's uh, 3179 Bianca Circle. It sounds like it was. I'll confirm in a moment. I, I see it in the copy provided by the assessor, like, but again, I just want to ensure it was in your official copy yes. as well. Thank you. Second question for the assessor for your market evaluation for 2022. Uh, I know you mentioned we, we weren't sure what was happening with 2022, so you didn't get to make the cover page. Uh, part of the requirements for the board is that we verify the enrolled value um, discussed. So based on my records for 2022, based on what was filled in on the application, which may or may not be accurate, the original enrolled value for 2022 was $1,228,000. Is that correct from the assessor's records as well? Uh, if you can give me just a second, I can pull our system up and double check. Thank you.
Okay, yes, the 1122 value was 1,228,000. Do you want it broken down by land? In no, that's not necessary. That okay. matches what was written on the appeal. I just wanted to verify. So that if I'm standing correct, understanding correctly, your market evaluation, your rec is it that you're recommending the board reduce it to 1,000,000? Or was that just the number um, determined by the appraisal? I wasn't sure. The, the assessor the is recommending a further reduction to the 1015000 yes. Thank you for clarifying. No further questions. Okay. I think now it's time for the applicant to present your side. Okay. I just had one question as to the other representatives' names from the assessor's office, so I know who I'm addressing. Uh, my name is Joe Phillips. Steve Bates, B-A-T-E-S. Would it be possible to take a five-minute quick break? Yeah, that would be fine. Okay, thank you. Let's um, return at 11.30. Thank you.
All right, it's 1130. We're back in session, and now it's time to hear the applicant's presentation. And Chair Sisk, I have handed out applicant's exhibit one to the board for review. Thank you. Excuse me if my voice is, <clears throat> I'll try to make it as clear as possible. Um, I've included a copy of what I'm going to read to you um, that you can reference later. There's a lot of history on my property. Not all of it was presented by the assessor. So that's what is included here. My name is Andrew Barodi. I was born in Florida, raised in Pennsylvania, and I am an American with a disability for over 25 years. In July of 2020, I fell from a 20-foot extension ladder onto my forehead and sustained a head injury and some brain trauma that compounded my disability. There are more than several issues that I'll be addressing this morning in regard to how the assessor has been unfairly assessing the taxes on our property and the discriminatory adversarial retaliatory manner that I have been treated by employees of the assessor's office. <clears throat> That's just one of the issues. A second issue is the earthquake fault line that runs through our property that we were not made aware of prior to our purchase, nor was it disclosed. This information was presented to us in 2009. A third issue is that of the abandoned environmentally hazardous extraction, oil extraction facility located on our home residential property that negatively impacts the value of our property. Other issues include conditions of the property that the assessor never acknowledges or factors into their yearly assessment of value that we are taxed on. I've been a resident of Ventura County for over 44 years, and I've been a realtor and California licensed real estate agent in good standing since 1988 for 35 years. I've been a resident of Ventura County for over, I'm sorry, I purchased our current property, the subject property of this hearing, 3803 Walnut Avenue, Simi Valley, at the height of the real estate market in September of 2005. This has been our home for my wife and two children for the last two years, or last 17 years. I believe I did overpay on the property at the time because I paid about the same dollar per square footage for this 1984 built home without the amenities and modern improvements of the brand new custom homes and semi-custom homes constructed and selling in the local area during the same time period. But that was the market at the time. After the sale closed September 18th, 2005, I began seeing an immediate drop in property values and a slowing of the market. Values all over were on the decline. Excuse me. <clears throat> and this was evidenced by not only properties taking longer to sell, but there was a dramatic increase in foreclosures over the next seven years. Early in 2006, I began representing many banks for managing their assets listing and selling their REO properties, and I handled these assets in and throughout Ventura, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Kern counties. In the following years, 2006, 7, 8, and I believe 9, despite the obvious decline of property values throughout California and across the nation, the Ventura County Tax Assessor consistently every year continued to increase my property taxes and increase the assessed value on our property without a proper and fair assessment. The negative impact on our family has been having to pay tens of thousands of dollars in unjustified property taxes. Even though properties were consistently and continuously selling for less value in every neighborhood, community, 
in every county in California and across the nation, the Ventura County Assessor was suggesting by continually raising the taxes on our property that although every property around us in Simi Valley <coughs> was, I'm sorry, was declining in value that our property was somehow unique and increasing in value during that same time. How is that possible? When I contacted the assessor to question them on this, they acted indifferent to me and offered no explanation other than to suggest that I have the right to an application to appeal these assessments if I didn't agree with their assessment of value. At that time, I was very busy with my real estate business and did not have the time, nor could I make the priority to file any appeals to these increases of taxes and increased assessed values by the Ventura, Ventura County Tax Assessor. In 2009, our adjoining neighbor to the west, Bill Belfontaine, began developing his 12 and a half plus acres. He had acquired the property 3799 Walnut Avenue, <clears throat> APN 614-0010-265 in the adjacent parcel 614-0010-225 on June 3rd, 2003. Both of our properties are zoned for one residential estate per acre. Part of his development process required him to trench approximately 20 feet wide, 30 feet deep, and 100 feet plus in length to locate the earthquake fault line, which determined where he could build his homes and how many homes he would be allowed to build. After Mr. Belfontaine's geological report was completed, he disclosed to me shortly after that the earthquake fault line ran through his 12 acres and continued directly through our property underneath where our home dwelling is situated. Discovering the location and direction of this earthquake fault line negatively impacted not only Mr. Belfontaine's property value, but it also has negative impact on our property and property value. But the assessor has never factored that fact into the assessments. Instead of being able to build 12 acres on, or 12 estates on 12 acres because of building and safety regulations of having to build more than 100 feet from the fault line, he could then only build six homes and the required cost for street improvements made it prohibitive for him to develop the land. Since then, he has not been able to resell the property due to the disclosure of this fact of the earthquake fault line and its negative impact on any future development of his property. My zoning allows me to develop and subdivide my property into three one-acre parcels. And I plan to do this so that my wife and I can give our son and daughter an acre each to have a home built on these. However, this earthquake fault line will have a negative impact and effect on my being able to do this. This is further negatively impacted by the environmentally hazardous abandoned oil extraction facility that is also located on and throughout our property. I will speak in more detail of this in a moment as the Ventura County Tax Assessor has argued for years that neither of these major conditions has a negative impact or effect on the value of our property. I have made application for appealing my property tax assessment more than several times in the past. For many years, the Ventura County Tax Assessor and its employees and management and other county agencies have treated me in a discriminatory, hostile, aggressive, retaliatory, vindictive, and intimidating manner, not to mention being rude and unprofessional. As well, I have been treated unfairly by panel members in the past that have heard my case. One year I was here for a hearing and the first case appeared that it would go all day and that other cases may not be gotten to. One gentleman requested a postponement because of that and they granted that gentleman his post postponement. A second man requested the same and his postponement was granted. I then requested the same, but instead of granting me the same courtesy as the other two gentlemen, the assessor's office manager, I believe this was Mr. Horn, argued to not grant me the postponement as the other two were provided. Knowing and with the intent that I would be made to sit there in the courtroom all day to waste my time and just to be malicious to me. However, the panel approved my postponement, but the demeanor and actions of the assessor was obvious. 
On another date, while here at the courthouse for a different issue, I ran into a panel member. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't want to interrupt you. I want you to have plenty of time to provide your case. But we're really only here to hear issues of valuation. Any disagreements you have with the assessor's office should be addressed between them and you or some other forum. But we're here as judges only on valuation. I understand. So, I, yeah. I understand that. However, no, I understand that. My, you, you pres know this. my presentation and the history on this is important for. Well, you my concern is we decision. have a lot of issues to address concerning the property, and you know, adding these other issues just prolongs the hearing and doesn't really add anything to the valuation question. You can go on if you wish. I'm just. I, a, I, I wish to. Okay, go ahead. Again, this gives context to <clears throat> the assessor's assessment. I ran into a panel member, Vince Curtis, a longtime acquaintance. When I explained my property tax appeal situation to Mr. Curtis, he advised me to not bring in any comparables. As I remember his words were, don't even bother mentioning comps. He explained that he sat on several tax assessment appeal boards, and one homeowner in Malibu stated that their property wasn't worth anything because of the potential for the hillside to collapse from an earthquake or heavy storms, and that that appeals board voted in his favor. He advised me to just focus on the fact that an earthquake fault line ran through the property. During that hearing, Mr. Curtis did not sit on the panel. The assessor's office management presented their case, and after presenting mine, they took a very adversarial posture, attempting to insult me with inferences that I was stupid and ignorant. Part of their counter response was that everyone knows there's earthquakes in California, and that as a real estate agent, I should be aware of that. One of their suggestions inferences was, if you're such a good real estate agent, then why did you buy the property? I explained again that in 2005, when we purchased the property, this information was not available or disclosed to us. They ignored the fact that I spoke directly to there being an earthquake fault line running through the property and that I was not referring to an earthquake zone or earthquake area. I explained the difference, but I was not listened to or treated fairly. The assessor continued to argue that this information that I presented in no way negatively affected the value or had any impact for consideration in the assessment. When it came time for me to ask my questions, I asked the assessor appraiser, if you found out tomorrow that an earthquake fault line ran through your property, wouldn't that affect the value of your property? The gentleman that was chairing the panel that morning interrupted stating he would not allow that question to be asked. When I asked him why he was not allowing me to ask that question, his response was, it's not relevant. I found that to be very unfair treatment by the panel and a bias exercised in favor of the county and the county assessor. In 2013, we were made aware that the oil company operator of the facility on our property was negligently operating the oil extraction facility and they were non-compliant with certain conditions as required by Division of Oil, Gas, and Ge Geothermal Resources, also known as DOGGER and the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District. The operator was leaking oil onto our property and releasing toxic vapors into our property airspace through negligently maintained lanterns that were supposed to be burning off the vapors. This system was a system required by the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District to be installed and operating as part of an exemption for the oil operators so they didn't have to install a more expensive but more efficient vapor recovery system. Can in I, August of 2013. Can I interject really quick? Can I? I'm sorry. We're, can I inter interrupt really quick? Um, we're really trying to get to the, the meat of the valuation from 2021 and 22. Um, these are references from 2016 and 2013, and in old conversations. You want to maybe go to the point to where we start talking about the value issues? I think it would help. Well, if you would please allow me the courtesy of okay. finishing this. Okay. Again, if you're listening to what I'm reading to you, this will give you context to know how assessments have done, have been okay. handled every year and understand what I'm explaining to you. The oil operator was leaking oil under our property and releasing toxic vapors. 
In August of 2013, both Dogger and VCAPCD came to the property, did their annual inspections and signed off that there were no leaks and that the facility was compliant. My neighbor, Kevin Towhill, and I filed complaints because there were obvious leaks and the vapors were seeping into the Towhill's backyard with their three young children where they played. Dogger sent two field engineers out to address our concerns, but instead they just minimized the situation, treated us in a dismissive manner, and ignored the conditions that were later found to be non-compliant. We had to get the officials of the city of Simi Valley and Ventura County involved to have a meeting with both Dogger and VCA PCD at the City Hall of Simi. Again, both agencies acted in a manner that was dismissive, minimizing the environmental hazard that exists on our property and would not answer certain questions or allow the meeting to be videotaped. Everyone agreed to meet at our property to have the wells and facility reinspected with all parties present. Approximately two months after both agencies signed off that there were no leaks and that the facility was compliant, it was simply shown that there were major leaks and conditions that were non-compliant. Dogger, just so you know, is now referred to as CalGem, and that is the agency that when there was the gas leak over Porter Ranch, they minimized that situation and were dismissive to those 3,000 plus homeowners, saying that it was not a big deal. And it was a day or two later that a satellite image was presented that showed the giant gas plume. So this is the same agency that I have been dealing with. Both agencies cited the oil operator, C.R. Barnett, and required that they shut in the wells until they repaired the leaking wells and addressed the non-compliant issues. And again, these are documents that the assessor has that I asked about that Ms. Hill would not respond positively to. <coughs> In December, Eric Weatherby of the VCAPCD came back to the property as a follow-up inspection to verify that all work had been completed. During the main inspection with city and county officials, some of the non-compliant issues were the very ones that Ernie Blevins, field engineer with Dogger, dismissed as not a problem and not an active leak. I requested Mr. Weatherby test the lower well that he had not tested before because the well cellar was filled with approximately 30 gallons of oil that had leaked from that machinery and pipes. He refused to use his instrument to test that well, became argumentative, uncooperative, and after 10 to 15 minutes of pleading with him to test it, just flat out would not accommodate my request. Despite the fact that he then walked to the other well, which had been cited for a leak, and used his instrument to verify on that one that there was no leak. The following year when they did their annual inspection, that well was shown to be leaking that he refused to test that day. Instead of both agencies being accountable and responsible for the fraudulent reports that both agencies filed, they instead acted in a retaliatory manner towards me by continuing in the future to make negative mischaracterizations about me and state falsehoods, or as some people know them to be lies, and sided with the oil operator. I will come back to those lies shortly. In June 2014, the oil operator filed a malicious lawsuit against my wife and I and our property. Their intention was to bury us in legal fees and acquire our property through a quiet title action. In the 1959 lease, there was a clause that stated if the landowner interferes with the production of oil, the landowner can be made to forfeit their right and title in the property to the oil leaseholder. They then filed bankruptcy so they wouldn't be responsible to have to pay for the cleanup, contamination remediation, and removal of the facility. Somehow they filed their oil and mineral rights as their assets in a no asset chapter 13 corporate bankruptcy and still retain these oil and mineral rights. We were defended by and represented by our title insurance and homeowner insurance companies, so they were not successful in what they were attempting to do to us. 
but the four and a half years of the lawsuit did take its toll on my real estate business and my overall health. So I'd say they proved successful in being malicious and causing us some personal harm and damage. In 2015, Bruce Hessen with Dogger created a legal order for the wells to be plugged and abandoned. That's the legal order that Ms. Hills referenced. In January 2016, Dogger requested access to our property in order to have contractors come to inspect the facility in order to provide quotes for the completion of the plugging and abandonment work to be done. A week or so later, Dogger counsel, James Pierce, emailed me and Kevin Towhill that they were postponing the inspection and would not be doing it, and that if and when in the future they would do it, they would contact me. In December of 2016, the lawsuit was still ongoing, and during a deposition, Bruce Hessen, the district deputy representing Dogger, committed perjury several times by stating that I denied access to the wells for the inspection that they, Dogger, and their counsel postponed. I was not aware of this until a year or two later when I received copies of that deposition, as I was not present. In a subsequent hearing for my property tax assessment appeal, I was bringing to the attention of the Ventura County Assessor the nature of the negative impact of this environmentally hazardous abandoned oil facility on our property value. Once again, the assessor took an adversarial posture towards me and argued that it had no negative impact on our property value and suggested that I had full use and enjoyment of our property. Despite everyone at the hearing swearing to tell the truth and hold the truth, Ventura County Assessor's management and appraiser presented completely false information. The assessor stated that there were funds approved and contracts approved to remove the facility. And in his words, essentially, in fact, there was a construction crew approved at the gate there to do the work and remove the facility, but Mr. Brody denied them access and wouldn't allow them to do the work. The assessor was attempting to influence the board panel by blaming me for the facility being there and that my complaint issue concern shouldn't be given any consideration because it was my fault that the work didn't get done. Again, this was absolutely false information with no truth to it, yet the assessor presented this false information. <clears throat> when I got my opportunity to ask questions, I asked where did he get the information and he stated Dogger. I asked who at Dogger gave you that information and he responded with Ewan Beanham. I asked, did you have co copy of the contracts? His answer was no. I asked if he had copies of the approved funds and again, his answer was no. When I asked why he didn't ask for those items, he responded something to the effect of I didn't think it was relevant or that I needed to. Dogger has ignored me for years and there has never been an access agreement generated nor provided to me and there was uh, never any letter of intent from Dogger to do any work. In fact, they have refused for years to do the annual inspection that they are required to do. So that was my experience of the assessor providing false information and what I deem to be adversarial posture with me. For the 2019 year assessment, I closely communicated with Joe Phillips with the assessor and gave him the complete history. I also informed him of now there were funds and contracts approved, but Dogger, now referred to as CalGem, in their retaliatory actions, refused to do the work. The work had been approved and funding approved, but because of COVID, the work got delayed without me knowing. It wasn't until, I believe, January 2021 that CalGem contacted me. They sent me a signed copy of the property access and hold harmless agreement, but refused to answer any of my questions concerning the agreement. I had later signed this with my wife, had it notarized and certified mail to both or all three agencies, uh, CalGEM Division of uh, Department of Conservation. And I also forwarded copies of this signed notarized access agreement to the county assessor. What was represented today by Ms. Hill was that they never received the access agreement from us, which again is false. <clears throat> In 
The agreement stipulated that homeowner responsible for trimming the trees and moving the wood. However, when I contacted them and asked them what trees, what branches, how high up, how far back, and what wood are you referring to, they essentially cut off all communication with me as I called and emailed at least eight employees that were CC'd on earlier emails to me, and none of them would respond to me. Later, I found out that they were being instructed to ignore me. I finally got through to one administrator, Clayton Haas, and he acted and spoke to me in an angry, intimidating manner and wouldn't allow me to even speak or ask any questions such as the above. And if the contractor doing the work is required to have $5 million of liability insurance, why are they putting into the agreement that I have to hold them harmless for any possible damage that should happen to my property? They would not allow me to even ask that question. Later, when I continued to attempt to contact someone at the Department of Conservation in CalGEM to address my issues and the intentional ignoring of the legal order for the work to be completed, Mr. Clayton called me and verbally threatened me. I since filed a complaint on Mr. Clayton that had been looked into. When I wrote a response to him that I didn't appreciate his tone with me, nor did I appreciate his intimidation and bully tactics, he chose to act on his personal feelings instead of just being responsible for the legal order and the approved work, and he instead acted in a retaliatory manner and has made it so that the work wouldn't be completed by the June 30th date of that year and that it will never get done. So despite what the assessor has been presenting, this is the experience that I've had with the agencies, and there is no intention for them to remove this facility. It's part of the negative impact. He took this posture with me and made it so that Cal Jim and the De Department of Conservation pretty much ignore me completely. They refused to abide by the order to plug and abandon the facility on my property, but did end up removing and plugging the well on my neighbor's property. That shows the discriminatory manner that I was dealt with by the state. I even made a public records request from CalGEM and DOC, and they have refused to provide documentation that they have on file. I've explained this information to Mr. Phillips, and he said per an email he received, CalGEM will do it sometime in the future if they ever deem it a priority. But they have no intention of cleaning up my property of this abandoned oil facility that has contaminated our property. No one is going to want to purchase my property with this problem. Joe Phillips said he adjusted the assessed value by 10%, but would never explain and be specific about 10% of what. When I questioned him on how he came up with the 10%, his response was that he felt that was fair for a nuisance. So I would like it explained to me where feelings come into play on an appraisal. When he would not compromise on this value, I escalated the matter to Brooke Hill. She was very curt with me on the phone and would not compromise in any manner to the points that I was making. So I ended up agreeing to a stipulated value of 900,000. This last year, I was contacted by Ms. Ramirez to discuss my property value. The nature of this call is further covered in copies of emails that I sent to the assessor, part of this package, after she really hung up on me to document the issue. Essentially, she called to discuss value of my property, and I began to inform her of the history on my property, as well as my history of interactions with assessor employees and past appeals. She acted indifferent to me as though she didn't care to hear what I had to say, similar to some of the reaction that you guys don't care to really hear my presentation of these facts. She made a comment to the extent of the lowest I could adjust the value to be, and it was a 930,000 some figure. The exact figure is not clear to me after what transpired next. At one point in the conversation, she asked me what I thought the value of the property was. As I attempted to answer her question, she began to interrupt me and try to control the conversation. I find that to be rude and an attempt by the person to be intimidating and bullyish. 
I was trying to explain to her how I have had interaction with many people that are aware of the problems with the property and that for them, they aren't interested in the property and therefore it has no value to those individuals. I then asked her if she would buy a property like mine and she quickly and defensively snapped at me in an angry tone. You can't ask me that, that's a personal question. As I further tried to explain to her the nature of my question and how it was relevant to determining my property's value, she continued to interrupt me, raised her voice at me, and when I didn't concede to her intimidation, she hung up on me as I was attempting to explain. I immediately filed a complaint to Brook Hill. In following up with my complaint, it appeared that Ms. Ramirez was now acting in a personal manner of retaliation by selecting higher value properties to use in my property value assessment. In bringing this up with Ms. Hill, my concerns and questions were ignored. And you have copies of these communications in the packet I provided. I attempted to address the adjusted value of 930, whatever it was, but Ms. Hill refused to allow that conversation and refused to have a conversation <coughs> uh, with Ms. Ramirez to ask her what I was re referring to that Ms. Ramirez had mentioned in our conversation. Now it appeared that Ms. Hill was siding with Ms. Ramirez and I was being treated in the typical manner that the assessor's office has treated me and spoken to me in the past. I then escalated this matter, I believe, to Keith Taylor and received similar treatment by Mr. Taylor as he was not addressing my concerns and was ignoring my questions in my emails. Even though I expressed to Ms. Hill my intention of my questions and communications was to receive cooperation from the assessor's office that we could arrive at a stipulated value as was done in prior years, the assessor's office refused to co cooperate with me in that manner. Now they've cherry picked certain properties to raise my property taxes as a form of retaliatory punishment and malicious vindictiveness. That's my experience. And in my experience over the years, there has definitely been a culture for the assessor's office to protect and cover their own for the inappropriate actions and tactics. I state all this as part of my testimony to bring light to this and make it a matter of record. <clears throat> I don't see where they have used comparable property that has an abandoned environmentally hazardous oil facility on it. I don't see where they've considered the factors and made proper adjustments for those factors. I have eroding hillsides that require hundreds of thousands of dollars of retaining walls to prevent further erosion, mudsliding, and additional damage. I have a pool that was built in approximately 1961 that has many cracks and leaks that will require over 50,000 to repair. The road Lightning Ridge Way is on my property and because of various cellular companies, utility companies, trash companies, city public works damaging the road over the years with their large trucks, it is in need of major repair that will cost over 50,000. None of those companies are paying for my road repair, that will be on me. In past years, the panel board has repeated given the benefit of the doubt to the assessor and repeatedly acted in a biased manner in favor of Ventura County and against me. Even when the county assessor presented false information, and they're doing it again today, and went out of their way to use properties that were not located in Simi, not today, but in a past assessment appeal, uh, they had picked properties from Westlake Village and West Hills. How is that even justified or considered fair and ethical? Taking into account, they're taking everything into consideration, including inconsistency with assessor assessment to my property and based on other comparables and making adjustments for the condition of my property and the other negative factors that impact our property value in a negative manner. I'm requesting that you approve and find in favor of me on this and my other appeal application for the value of 732,250. And the other documents that are attached to this show where uh, my adjoining neighbors have, uh, in one case, a negative percentage change. Um, a 1% um, 
a 0.01% change, but with my property from 2019 to 2020, there is a 24.5% increase. Even though the other properties showed 1% or 2%, 21 and 22 show a 6.6% .6 increase and a 2.76 increase. The following pages document the conversations that I've had email-wise with Ms. Hill, Mr. Uh, Taylor, and Ms. Ramirez. I've included the plot map so you can see the adjoining properties. And there are also estimates, copy again of um, other comparable properties where based on their dollar per square foot value, that's how I arrived at my value. <clears throat> Okay. Are you all set? Are you yes. finished? Okay. Thank you for hearing me out on that. Okay, thank you. Any um, questions from the assessor's office? Mr. Brody, did you do an appraisal of the subject property? No, I have not. Okay. Did so you presented a few um, documents about your neighbor's properties? Um, Mr. or the Tarpley, Towhill, and Bellafontaine properties. Uh, did any of these properties sell in 2020 or 2021 on the open market? They have, you can see there, they sold from 2002 to, I believe, 2017. Okay, so none of them sold in 2020 or 2021 or not even 2019. No, the purpose of showing you the adjoining neighbor's information was that it is showing an increase and in one of them a negative value percentage of assessed value for the land. Okay, and so in my property, the assessor has increased my value by... 24 and a half percent in the one year. So I'm not understanding how my adjoining neighbors that don't have the negative factors on their property, Mr. Bellafontaine does because he's the one that informed me of the earthquake fault line. But those land values have not adjusted in the same fair percentage that the assessor is assessing my property. Okay, so are you aware that property tax rule four requires that we look at comparable sales at close in time to the subject property valuation date? I, I have provided those to you. Okay, did There's you make- two pages in there that cover both did, appeal in, applications. Did you make any adjustments to those sales? to account for the differences between the subject property and the comparables you provided? The adjustments I used were the negative factors on my property using their dollar per square foot that they sold for. What is your final estimate of value? Right there, I have it. Right where? Well, I believe it's on my application. Okay, on and your, so 732,250? Uh, read it to the panel, the 732,250, okay. I believe it is. Okay. Chair Sisk, if I actually had a question on that since we're talking about it. Mr. Brody, we have two years of appeals, one for January 1st, 2021, and another for January 1st, 2022. So what is your market value conclusion for each of those years, if you could clarify? I have it as both. Both, so both I, years. I, I don't have the the application for 2022. Okay. So if you have it, it may be on that. Well, well so to clarify, the application itself is non-binding, so that wouldn't matter. It's what you present to the board today. So I just want to clarify for the record, 
your opinion of value for both years as of today and completion of your review is 732,250. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Okay, does <clears throat> any more questions of the applicant's presentation? Yeah, I, I just, one more, a clarifying question for one you just answered. Brooke asked, in your list of comps here, if you made adjustments to them, I believe your answer was yes. I, I didn't see those adjustments. Can you explain where those are? I made adjustments to derive the value of my property. Yeah, I'm asking. And so as you look on the other documents that show the cost for the retaining walls, the cost for the uh, repair of the roads, the cost for repairing the pool. Okay, so if I'm understanding, you selected a dollar per square foot within the range of comps, and then you took your cost to cure and subtracted that from it? Is that? Correct. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, no further questions. We do have just a one-page rebuttal document that we'd like to submit before closing. We don't have to really say much about it other than okay. submit it. <laughs> okay. Any questions from the board of the applicant's presentation? Go ahead. Um, in your testimony, you noted that the property decreased in value um, in 2005 through 2009, was a Prop 8 election made? I'm sorry. Was a Prop 8 election made during the years that you believe that your property decreased in value? I'm sorry, I still didn't hear the first part. Uh, Prop 8 election, was a Prop 8 election uh, made during the years that you believe that your property decreased in value? Uh, I don't know. I've been told that my property is Prop 8. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's all the questions. Okay. I have. Um, do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, you didn't present any pictures of the house itself. The only pictures I have of the house itself are your 2000 and uh, I think it was 13 listing. It's a blurry picture of the front of the house. Uh, is that a pretty accurate picture? For that portion of the house, it's under uh, Assessor's Exhibit A, page uh, one, two, three, four on the back of it. There's on the front is a an overhead view, and on the back is the listing. And since we don't have a picture of the house itself, I'm trying to get an idea what it looks like. Is that really? I mean, I'm sure there's been some plants come and go, but I mean, relatively, uh, I'm as sorry. far as the are you referring Page to, to this? I have to put my glasses on. No, that's not oh, it. The next page. Yes, yeah, so the next page. It, it shows a portion of the house, and then it goes on to the following pages. It's just a copy of the listing, of your original listing is in 2013. Here. No, I don't have a copy of that. Oh, I, I did find it. That is at this point. At this point, is that the most accurate picture we have? Have of the residents? Do you have any a, other? That's a portion of the purpose of listing the property at that time was because we were being sued by the oil operator, and they were trying to acquire our property. Okay, I was more interested so, really in just, I was trying to get a, a so, mental picture of the house, that's so all. So if we couldn't um, prevail in the lawsuit of them acquiring our property, I wanted to be able to prove damages, um, so I listed the property at the five million. That's, that was what the purpose of that was for. Okay, and if you could go to Assessor's Exhibit B, and what page? Nobody wants to put pages on their exhibits anymore. We've got five of eight, and then it stops. Eight of eight, then we have a draft. 
Then we have another draft, and on the back of that draft, it shows what appears to be the areas that are of concern. I'm looking at this. Okay. Okay. And it shows a lower pump area. It shows, which matches that circle that I had pointed out earlier. And it shows a loading area and then at the top an upper. Now, do all three of those need to be evacuated? The, yes. the, those are, those are um, the oil facility is comprised of two wells with pumps, a uh, pipeline that runs some underground and some overground. It was all supposed to be, uh, per ordinances and codes, 36 inches below ground. There's the vapor burn-off system of approximately two dozen or a dozen, I can't remember at the moment, uh, lanterns that were uh, not maintained and just releasing the vapors. There's the uh, abandoned oil holding tank from a long time ago, and then the other major uh, holding tank. And then there's pipes and uh, the loading area. And on my pictures, it's kind of hard to see. I don't have the resources for a color printer. Okay. However, if you look at um, the uh, first page, shows the loading area uh, just below the... I'm sorry, the first page of what? I'm sorry, this is... Uh, of, I have five pages of photos. Oh, okay. That show the oil facility, the hillsides, and the pool. Right. So let's say okay. number one on the photo shows a... I guess that's a pump, right? So uh, the the number one, um, the, the top photo is the loading area. And where and would that uh, where would that correspond to on the on the on the map that you were that I was referring to? On that would be the northeast corner where you see the loading area. And there are two circles. Evacuation five. Oh, I'm sorry. Evacu it says evacuation one, evacuation two, and uh, loading area. Okay, so that's your that's the first of of your photos. Right, and it's a little hard to make out there, but I have forwarded um, color photos to the assessor in the past that show. And There's a, a large area there, probably 10 feet by 10 feet, that nothing grows. You can see I've got weeds all around, but the soil's been contaminated there and nothing grows. Okay, and photo number two, which is a chain that, link around it, where is that at? So number two in the middle shows the pump, which is on the left of the diagram, upper pump cellar area. Okay, and so it actually would turn it around because there's a retaining wall there. So when the owner built the property, he built his block wall inside of some of the uh, property lines. Okay. He didn't want that <clears throat> well pump. Co continuing the, the with, the, with the photos, if you will, the next page. Well, at the bottom of that one is the front side of that well in the middle and there's an area there that nothing grows and that's where the pipeline comes down and um, so this is this is the north east north triangle west. right it's that upper pump is the uh, more the west Oh, evacuation the, five? The loading area would be northeast. Of I guess what I'm trying to get at is uh, photo number three on page one, that retaining wall. Where would I find that? Um, or do you know? On this to, diagram? Yeah, on this diagram. Uh, they, they really don't 
okay. have the block wall that is the perimeter of our property okay. included in that diagram. Let's go on to the, to the next page. Um, but the top photo on the next page is the lower pump cellar area where it says evacuation four. That's right in the middle of the property. That's photo four. And, and, and that's just, what is that? Is that just a flat area? I can't make it out. Um, to the left is a old blacktop area. This used to be a public swimming pool, kind of a private uh, club so, in the 60s. And so that is a large blacktop area that is kind of disintegrating. So we're talking about the second page of photos on the very top. Looks like it has benches or something like that. Right. They used to play volleyball across that blacktop. Okay. And the and the lower pump area is that that's what that photo is. So that's they built this on top of the lower on top of this lower pump area. Then. That lower pump area sits essentially almost in the middle of the property. Okay. So and that's now, now part the, of what impacts it negatively because as long as this facility is here. I'm not able to subdivide and um, provide my children with an okay. acre each. And then the middle photo, which looks like it's a somewhat of a hillside that's falling, where is that at? That is, if you were to draw a line between... Again, the, looking, at your, looking at this same diagram. So where, the, where the pool is here, <clears throat> looking. that hillside is to the left and it uh, runs parallel to the blue line, the dashed blue line. All and along it, there? So right, in, that would be in back of your house, right? It's, it's right in the middle. The, the third photo is almost directly behind our house. And whereabouts is the property line? Is the property line in front of that hillside? Or, that, or is it in back of that hillside? The, the property line is up here where they have the evacuation three and upper pump area. The property line is beyond where the block wall is in the one photo. So with my uh, north adjacent neighbor, there's a block wall that uh, divides our two properties. I, I, it's not clear to me. So we, we picture the may I, picture in the bottom I draw picture. draw a line and, and to, hand it? Well, that you'd have to do that for everybody. So if you can describe so where we, that, what, where, where the property, well, on the pictures themselves, where is the property line? In front, in back, right in the middle where that is falling? Okay, if you can see this line here, this is where the pool is, and I believe on the aerial that is provided by Let's the do it by clock. Let's say this is the, having this on the, on the standing it up like that, so with, if with, you, with 12 being the top and if you what's see, on the bottom, six? If you see the outline of the pool area, yeah, this hillside is approximately 15 feet off from the pool to okay. the west. But, and my question though was, where is the property line? Where you see the blue dotted line that- No, I understand where it is on there, but I'm looking at the photo and I don't know that the property line may be 10 feet on back of where that starts falling or 10 feet in front of that or right down the middle of that. No. I, no, on your photo, go back to your photo. You see what I'm saying? You got two pictures of the, where there seems to be some, some need, I think he said a need for, the, for the retaining hill, walls. Right, the hillside. The hillside. Erosion. It's about a, is I'm gonna say about. 15 feet from the pool area. 15 feet? The property line. So it's between the property line and the? Correct. And the pool? And the pool? That hillside collapsed. Okay. And that's, what that's the purpose of the, need for a retaining wall. The other area, which is the number three photo, is almost directly behind our house. Okay, 
And on that, there are several tall eucalyptus trees that uh, if there's further erosion, those trees could uh, top along to the... What you, have to remember, what you have to remember is we have not been out to the property. You've been there every time. You know where the garage is. You know where the house is. You know where the pool. We have none of that idea. So we're trying to get a, a visual of how this property looks. Well, on the, the third photo there, where the D, where it says draft, that's where that hillside erosion is. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Um, of all the sales that you provided, do any of those have any oil wells on them? No. None do? None okay. do. Okay. Okay. Does the board have any further questions of the applicant? No. Bless you. Um, okay. All right, so we are done with questions of your presentation, and I believe the assessor's office had a rebuttal document. Okay. Okay. Do you mind if I ask the assessor's office a question? Um, having a, mark, a market evaluation, and it at the bottom of it, it says a million fifteen, and then I think you take that value and turn it into a value for for uh, twenty one and one for twenty two. Am am I missing something? Yes, there's two different market evaluations. One is for 2021, and that one we concluded a value of 960,500. And then for 2022, we concluded a value of 1,015. And, and the comps for the earlier evaluation, I'm somehow through all of this missed that. That would be Exhibit A. So the Exhibit A is 2021, and then the Exhibit E is 2022. Exhibit A? Correct. Okay, found it. Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, any other questions? No more. No okay. further questions. Okay, now it's time for closing arguments. Um, do we want to do the closing arguments now and then come back and deliberate afterwards and take a lunch after? Or do you want to do lunch before we do closing arguments? What time do we have lunch here? After we just I think we'd like to do our closing. Yeah, let's just do closing now and then we'll break for lunch and come back. Okay. That sounds good. Um Do we need to come back after the closing argument? No, or? you may not need to. Okay. So yeah. Um if you want to go ahead and make your closing statements now. Uh, earlier in my questioning I asked Ms. Hill if she had documents and was aware of the history of the leaks and non compliant issues on the property. Um, and she said no, or she wasn't able to speak to that. However, um, a while back, I received this package. This was September 29th of last year. Um, and part of it does include um, notices to comply, notices of leaks, so there's no inspection for recent years because there's supposed to be an annual inspection. And neither agency is cooperating to come out and do the inspection. As I explained, there is a history of uh, non-cooperation both with uh, VC, APCD, and what's now known as CalGEM, as much as the assessor keeps reasserting that they are responsible and they're going to do it sometime in the future, that's not the reality of the situation. The agency have mischaracterized me in the past. All I've attempted to do was 
protect my family and property. We had to call the police in because there was one morning when the oil operator and that video of this was using that loading area and leaking oil as it was going into the transport trucks. That was what started the uh, lawsuit from the oil operator at that particular time. And that's also where we got the other agencies involved. <laughs> <coughs> so for why ever they're allowing their personal feelings instead of just following the legal order to remove and abandon and plug the facility as they did on my neighbor's property. I don't know uh, why they maintain that posture with me. But my sense, because, the, the, and I could show you hundreds of emails uh, or records of phone calls where they've just ignored me. And so my experience is their intention is to not ever come back as long as I own the property. And as long as that facility is there, I have to disclose if I were to sell. I'm going to be 63 this year, and uh, we would like to sell the property in a couple of years. If we, if we stay, I'd like to be able to develop it and have our children live there with us. But as long as that facility is there, that impairs our ability to subdivide it and develop on it because there's clear ordinances or stipulation that I cannot build within 100 feet of that. Um, likewise, with the earthquake, I would imagine if we were able to develop, um, we would have to do some type of trenching in the area that may be buildable. But we can't do any trenching as long as that facility is there. Um, as I mentioned, I tried to explain to the assessor when they're asking me for a value. I'm not saying my property's worth nothing, like the gentleman in Malibu where Vince Curtis advised me to how to present to the panel. Uh, I'm just trying to get a fair representation of all what is on my property that needs improvement and point out what the assessor really is not taking into account. Um, and when I've attempted to cooperate with them, I've forwarded copies of documents, copies of emails, photos of the property in an attempt to just avoid everybody's time here at a hearing. They refused to cooperate with me. So um, I don't believe it's fair that my property is assessed 24.5% from 2019 to 2020. 2020, I missed that because of the accident. I was laid out for a few months. And even though I contacted the, uh, um, I believe I spoke to Brendan, uh, there was no exception for the fact that I was injured and uh, unable to file that year. Um, so now that year got an assessment, which again, this is why I was asking the assessor, what program are they using to determine the assessed value? Uh, I believe I heard her say that um, there are individual uh, assessor employees that do a separate appraisal. But with all of what the history on the property is, it doesn't appear that they ever take any of those factors into consideration, which is why I have to file the appeal each year. So I would like to not have to come here and spend my day. Uh, every time the assessor raises, I'm not practicing real estate like I was back then. So um, I'm actually uh, drive my wife to her work in Glendale. Neither one of us are getting uh, paid today. Everybody here, you guys get paid for this. But uh, I take my wife to work at eight in the morning, drop her off at nine. I then drive for uh, nine hours, come back, pick her up at six, and then we're back at home about seven, 7.30. So with 
two children to take care of that have their own disabilities. Uh, it's important for me to provide you all the information that I read to you. I appreciate you allowing me that time. Um, I hope you were listening and understand the context that that provides because I've never denied access to any agency. Anybody that wants to come to the property, I've provided instruction. Here's my email, here's my phone number. Just contact me and we can make arrangements. There definitely has been adversarial posturing towards me from tax assessor. The fact that I was trying to address a retaliatory uh, incident that was apparent with the numbers that were uh, sent to me, I believe they were actually in here. Um, neither Ms. Hill nor uh, Mr. Taylor cared to um, address those issues. And even though I would send multiple emails, if you took the time to read through those emails, you'd see where repeatedly I've said, this has been two weeks, you haven't responded to me. Uh, in this response, you didn't answer my questions. Can you please ask, uh, answer the questions? So there's not been a fair cooperation or treatment that has been afforded to me. Um, to give Brendan a compliment, over the years, my main contact has been with Brendan. He's always cordial, he's always polite, uh, a really complete opposite than the demeanor and attitude uh, that I experience when I'm interacting with any of the other employees uh, of the assessors. Um, when the value is raised and for every uh, I won't even make $1,200 this week just from not being able to work today. So for every $1,000 that gets raised, I have to work a whole week to barely make that uh, increase in tax. Uh, so I'm here just being determined to present all the factors. Uh, in the past, like I read, there's been more weight given to the assessor's office. They've presented information that's false. I provided them information that backs up the statements that I've made to them, and yet those are still ignored and there's not been compromise. Uh, I've tried to reach compromise with them on how do you arrive at the 10%. There's, it's just that we feel that that's fair but you're not using any other environmental property that has an amount that shows an adjustment and to suggest that, well, you'll be able to sell the property in the future and then you'll just take 10% off of that to the buyer. That's not how the market works. As I was explaining before, there's people that don't find any value to the property because they don't want the, and it's not just a nuisance, you know, if you live behind the railroad tracks or you're backed up to the freeway, that's a nuisance. To have an oil facility with contaminated soil that uh, the agencies responsible refuse to remediate it, that's more than a nuisance. So um, that's where in the past I've strived to have some compromise and they have not shown any compromise. So I'm hoping that uh, today you guys uh, understand I'm here, I'm telling the truth, I have the information, the information that I'm saying where there's been the history of past leaks and past problems that involve the agencies, uh, the county assessor would not acknowledge that they are aware the history of leaks and non-compliance, and um, they did not put forth that information this morning. Yet, in the package that they sent me, if you care to see, I can provide to Brendan to hand you uh, 
copies that show that history of leakage. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate that I have to raise issues of false information, but that's, uh, that's fact that assessor has presented false information in the past to substantiate their case. And I don't think that's right. So. Okay. <clears throat> All set. All right. Thank you. Okay. Assessor's office, it's time for your closing statements. Oh, yes. I guess to hand this out real quick. <clears throat> Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, so I think it's important that we we bring back into perspective here that we are looking at a very large lot that does have a nearly 3,300 square foot single family residence, uh, it, a gated single family residence. There's over a, a pool house that's over 1,100 square feet. Uh, the property has hill, mountain, tr and treetop views. Uh, the house itself had an extensive remodel and addition in the late 90s, between 98 and 99. And then the property did sell in 2005. Granted, it was at the peak of the market, but it did sell for $1.575 million in 2005. So I think it's important that we, we keep in mind that the factored base year value is nearly $2 million on this property, and the assessor is recommending a value that is about half that at 960500 for the 21 roll year. So the assessor is recognizing a significant reduction to the factored base year value. Uh, the assessors recognize the fact that the oil wells are on the property and has estimated the market impact of those. Um, as Mr. Brody stated, the neighbor was successful in having the facility on his property plugged and abandoned. Uh, the assessor's not here to, to determine why that hasn't happened on the subject property, but what the market impact of those facilities would be. The assessor's estimated for all the reasons stated earlier that that would be about a 10% negative adjustment um, by participants in the market. And as stated earlier, it didn't appear to have an impact um, when Mr. Brody purchased the property. And we've also looked at the earthquake fault line um, tried to pick comps within that earthquake fault line, as Mr. Brody suggested. I'll note that most of his comps are not, um, and many of them are as far as 5.5 or more miles away. Um, a lot of them are tract homes on very, very small lots that don't afford the same privacy uh, that a three-acre uh, home behind a gate would afford. Uh, so the, the assessor, for many reasons, didn't find um, most of the comparables Mr. Brody provided, frankly, comparable, um, because there were just too many differences. And as he said, none of, none of his comps either had, had oil facilities. So the assessor is acting on the best available information. Um, we gave no value to the pool and spa, uh, so that is kind of a non-issue. Uh, and we also took off um, the, full, the full amount that it would cost to repave the road, the portion of the road that's situated on Mr. Brody's property. So with that, um, you know, I, th I think other than that, it's just important that we remember that we do have to follow the RNT code. Um, we are here to estimate the value and we do have to follow property tax rule four, which requires comparable sales. It requires adjustments, um, which Mr. Brody didn't, he provided the sales, but didn't offer any adjustments to account for the differences between those sales. Going on a price per square foot uh, basis is not an acceptable appraisal methodology according to the State Board of Equalization, so we simply can't do that. Um, so with that, I just I, I ask the board to sustain the recommendation um, of the assessor uh, for the two roll years in question, and recognize that that in fact all of the issues were accounted for uh, in the assessor's appraisal, 
and um, the nearly 50% reduction is adequate. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, at th this time it wraps up both sides' testimony. We will take um, both sides' testimony and deliberate behind closed doors. We'll inform Brandon of our decision. It may take him a couple of days. Yes. Am I allowed to speak to any of what she rebutted with? Um, actually, no, because you've had your chance to make your closing arguments, and then it was theirs. Here, since there was a new document, so if oh, there's okay. any questions or comments actually, about yeah, that I document. Actually, questions in regards to this, so which was the only new piece of information introduced. Um, I would speak to the fact that uh, I included Wisdom Court, Vicky Court. These are properties... Uh, right around the corner or within a, a mile of me as well as Yardley. Um, the assessor is like, attacking the fact that some of my properties that I provided aren't within a certain range or within five miles, yet uh, the assessor has used properties in the past that go into Westlake, which is way further than five miles or West Hills. So there seems to be contradiction in uh, what they're arguing as far as their properties that they're including. Um, and again, if it's not viewed this time, if you look there, you'll see how my property is, the assessor is showing uh, even on these properties that they're presenting here, there's 1% or 2% increase, some negative percent. Uh, and these are with all of these properties as well as the, my adjoining neighbors that are 1% or less than 2%. Uh, yet on my taxes, the assessor is showing 6.6% increase from last year to this year, okay. and uh, it's on what I've presented to you. So uh, I think more needs to be considered than what they're just uh, displaying here, because there are a lot of factors that aren't included on this list of properties. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, the, the board will deliberate the both sides behind closed doors and we'll inform Brandon of our decision who will in turn inform you guys of your decision. So I believe we are all set. Um, court, yeah, well, yeah, we'll do that, yeah. Um, so right now court is adjourned. You're all set, thank you, sir. We just wanna go and do this now and not.